Hi, everyone. Welcome to Explorer Classroom with Jennifer Adler. I'm Megan Modafferi, Community Manager here at National Geographic Education. As always, we're excited about the international connections happening today. I'm broadcasting from National Geographic in Washington, D.C. Our host, Joe Grabowski, is in Ontario. Jennifer is in Florida, and we have classrooms viewing live from all over the world. If you're watching, tweet using the hashtag Let's Explore to let us know where you're watching from. You can also share questions with Jennifer using that same hashtag, which again is Let's Explore. No apostrophe, just L-E-T-S-E-X-P-L-O-R-E. -E -E. Now, before we get started, I just want to talk to our teachers for a second and remind you to check out natgeoed.org for free lesson plans, principal maps, resources, and professional development opportunities. And I want to thank our host, Joe Grabowski, and our wonderful explorer, Jennifer Adler, for being with us today. All right, Joe, we're ready on our end. Take it away. All right, Megan, thanks for the great intro. As Megan said, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'm a teacher in Guelph, Ontario. And it's my pleasure to host and introduce uh, our speaker for today. So most people don't realize that we are living and playing above our drinking water sources in many cases. And the activities that we take part in affect the quality of that water. So today joining us is National Geographic Young Explorer, Jennifer Adler. She spent her life in, on, and surrounded by the water. She uses a blend of science, writing, and photography to communicate how Florida's springs are at risk. She's currently working on an education project called Walking on Water, and she's using photography and writing to teach the next generation about our fresh water. So Jennifer, it's an absolute pleasure to have you today. Uh, we did have hangouts last month. Uh, where we talked to some explorers and we explored some uh, of the Bahamas Blue Hole. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity to take that learning even deeper today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Megan and Joe. I'm really excited to be here. And hi, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. I'm happy to share, be above water for a little bit here to share some of my underwater world. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so that you can see the pictures that I'm going to talk about. See if this works. So, can everyone see my screen? We gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you just saw what it looked like above water, and this is what happens when I go into a cave. This is me taking a selfie in the aquifer. So, a little bit incognito there. Um, but I want everyone, I want to start out and just ask everyone to think about how they started their day. And um, what did you do? Did you drink a glass of water, wash your hands, take a shower, or brush your teeth? And I'm guessing that most of you did at least one of those things. And I want you to take a second and think about where that water came from. So your answer will really vary depending on where you live. And people in different parts of the world get their water in different ways and from different places. So for example, in the Turks and Caicos in Bermuda, which is pictured here, people get their water from rainwater that collects on their specially designed roofs. And in places like Ila Holbosch, Mexico, I don't know. I don't know that this is actually working. Oh, there it goes. Okay. And in places like Ila Holbosch, Mexico, they actually truck in their water from the mainland and um, or it's filtered by this really expensive process on the island called reverse osmosis. Of all the water on our planet, only about 3% of it is fresh. And so most of it's actually frozen in glaciers and ice caps. So of the tiny, tiny fraction that's left of this liquid fresh water, most of it is actually in aquifers. So there's more liquid fresh water beneath your feet underground than you can see above ground, like in rivers and uh, lakes. So more than 2 billion people in the world rely on this water that's hidden beneath the surface. And groundwater makes, also makes up about half of the water that we use to irrigate our crops for commercial agriculture. But what exactly is an aquifer? Um, I think that because it's underground, people can uh, be kind of confused by what it actually is, because, mostly because we can't see it. So a lot of people think that the aquifer is a big underground pond or lake, but what it really is is just rock that's saturated with water. Here is a map of some of the major aquifers here in the U.S. And so there are aquifers all over the world that I know some of you guys are not in the U.S., but this just gives you an example of the different aquifers. So you can see the different colors here actually represent different types of aquifers. And a lot of that is because of the type of rock that um, makes them up. 
And so if we look at this aquifer here, if anyone is watching from the Midwestern US, this is the Ogallala aquifer. And it is what we call a fossil aquifer. So some of you probably read about that uh, when you're reading to get ready for today. And basically what that means is that just like fossils, the water in this, these aquifers is really old and new water isn't getting into the aquifer. Or if it is, it's just a tiny bit, such a small amount that when we pump water out, we're basically using up the water in that aquifer and there isn't going to be any left for us to use um, after we use it all. So I live down here in Florida where 92% of our population gets its water from, from the underlying aquifer. And that's about 18 million people. And sorry, the slides are going kind of slow. There we go. And I like to say that we can get, um, we can walk on water here in Florida because there really is so much water beneath our feet. But what's really neat about the aquifer here is that it is recharged by rain. So what that means is unlike the Ogallala aquifer where, where water doesn't really make its way back into the aquifer, here when it rains, the water can make its way back into the aquifer and recharge it. And so we like what we say is that Florida has one of the most productive aquifers in the world. It means that we pump it out, but also water gets back in. And so the Florida aquifer here is made of limestone. So when it rains, the raindrops are slightly acidic because they mix with carbon dioxide to form carbonic acid. And this, what this does is it disintegrates the rock little by little and makes it able to hold water. So as a visual, what you can think about is um, Swiss cheese. And so, you know, the cheese itself is still hard, but then there's um, little holes inside of it and those holes can hold water. And so in some places, the holes are really, really small. And in other places, they're big enough. You know, the water comes through and can carve more of them out. They can be these passageways that are big enough to swim through. So here's a map of the Florida aquifer, what it looks like. It's these brown and blue areas in the southeastern U.S. And what you're looking at is the dark brown areas are what we call confined, which means that there is a layer on top of the aquifer that makes it harder for, that would be harder for rain to get it back into the aquifer in those places. And it's also more separates our actions at the surface from underneath. And so stuff can still get back down into the aquifer through sinkholes and, um, but you know, in that area, the aquifer is a lot deeper, basically a lot farther underground. And then in the light tan areas, that's a thinner layer on top of the aquifer. And in the blue areas, the aquifer comes basically right up to the surface. And what's really neat about this part of the state specifically, the same blue area here in this map, is it is dotted with these springs. And so all of these blue dots here, hundreds of them are uh, freshwater springs. And what a spring is, is basically just when water comes up to the surface from underground. In this aquifer, the Florida aquifer feeds the highest density of springs in the whole world. So a lot of times I think when we think of Florida, we're tempted to think of beaches and palm trees. But what we really need to remember is that we have these incredible freshwater springs that um, oftentimes go unnoticed, but also supply us with all of our drinking water. So we can swim in these springs and this is what I really love to do. And so here, this is what it looks like when we submerge just beneath the surface. So you can see right above water, you have these trees in the sun, but then just beneath the water, we have um, this really clear water coming up from the aquifer. And then this big crack running through the middle of the photo is an entrance to an underwater cave. And when we dive down into these caves a little bit farther, this is what happens um, when you dive down and then look back up. So I'm about 30 or 40 feet deep here, looking back towards the sky and you can see my friends swimming over me here. And the water is actually so clear that you can still see the trees above my head. So even just looking at these maps and talking about the aquifer um, and even looking at pictures can still be confusing and it might be hard to understand what the aquifer looks like or what it feels like kind of without experiencing it. So one of the things that I love to do is go cave diving. And there should be a picture that will pop up here in a second. Um, there it is. So what really this means is that I put on a lot of gear, bring all the air that I need to breathe and go right down into the caves. But to do this, we need to have our cave diving certification, which takes a lot of time and special equipment and training. So what happens is that most people can go their entire lives without seeing the aquifer, which is their main source of water in Florida. 
or some people don't even really know it's there. So I wanted a way to be able to share the aquifer with other people and with um, students like you guys so that I created this 360 virtual tour of the aquifer to let anyone really take a dive into their water and learn more about it. So if you don't really know what I'm talking about with a virtual tour, just basically think if you've ever been on Google Street View, it's Google Street View where you can click from spot to spot and look around, but it's in an underwater cave. So I'm going to take and turn the um, screen share off now and show you guys some of the gear that I have here uh, so you can get a better idea of, um, of how I do this. So can you see me now? We got gotcha. you. Okay, awesome. yeah. okay, I'm just going to move you to the other side of the table. So hang tight for one second. Okay. Awesome. So what, what I have here is a lot of my, um, my cameras that I use. Okay, it looks like Jenny froze on us for a moment, but we'll just give it a second and see if she comes back for us. Camera goes in here. And then what you do is um, this, this ring here, it's called an O-ring, and that's really what keeps it, um, keeps the camera waterproof. So we take this and then we take the camera and we're gonna put the camera right into the housing and we secure it in there and then it's still um, not waterproof because we need to put the back on <laughs> and this could not go in the water like this but so we have the camera now mounted in there you can see the lens now popping to the front and then we take the back piece and we're going to clip on this is the back of the camera and what it does is it has all of the buttons on the back that you would need to press on your camera and it lines up perfectly with the camera inside the house. And so we put the back on the house and clip it in. And then what I've done here is actually um, take and get a special piece made for my camera that goes along the bottom that allows me to take these 360 pictures. So all it looks like, if you look here, this metal piece, it just looks like a piece of metal. But what it does is it rotates the camera around what's called the nodal point of the lens. And so basically just a fancy way of saying it helps me keep the camera in the right place when I'm taking these pictures. And so I'll put it onto a tripod and it actually goes um, like this. It goes this uh, portrait mode this way. And then we twirl the camera around underwater and take pictures in directions all the way around in a circle. So usually I'll take between uh, six and eight pictures around in a circle and then take one picture up towards the sky and then one picture down towards the ground. And so if you can imagine it, that will take um, enough pictures to make a complete circle. And what we also use is a lot of lights. So I'm gonna show you pictures of what it looks like later, but these are what some of the smaller lights look like here. In some of the pictures, we needed up to 12 lights to light up um, the cave because it's really, really dark in there. So that's the camera that I use. And now I want to give you guys an idea of what it looks like when we put these images back on the computer and are able to make them into a 360 virtual tour. So I'm going to give you guys my screen again. Um, there it goes. Let's see. So, awesome. So, this is the location where I shot these underwater photos. And so, this is what a spring looks like at the surface. So, you can see this really clear water in the right part of the picture. And then, this is my friend Leah who is helping me with a lot of the diving in the lights and just above her hand you can see this darker water and I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit right now and so if we look closely 
at this water, um, you see the dark color, and it actually is the Santa Fe River, and the dark color does not mean that it's dirty. Really, what it means is um, the water is called tannic, and so when think about when you have tea, and the tea gets stained from the um, leaves in the water, basically the leaves and the organic matter in the floodplain here are causing this water to be dark. And I want you to look closely at this buoy here because we're going to take and we're going to zoom out. We're going to take our drone and we're going to go up into the sky. And this buoy here is actually chained to the entrance to an underwater cave. And if you look very closely here, um, you can see there the same buoy is right there. And you see a little bit of a darker patch to the right of it. And that's the entrance to uh, five to almost six miles of underwater cave just from going right in that hole there right at the where that buoy is and but what you really can't see in this picture is what lies just underground so this is what the underground cave looks like a map of it and this is what we miss by being right at the surface so this is why people can go their whole lives without seeing the aqua because it's completely hidden so for this project, what I did was I chose nine locations within the cave to go down and take these photo, these um, 360 photos. And so when you do the ritual tour, you can start all the way at number one and then dive your way all the way back in to number nine inside of the cave. So to give you an idea of what it looks like, if we zoom in here on number three, uh, we will get down into Devil's Eye, which is one of the entrances to Janie Springs. Um. Sorry, I think it froze. There it goes. So this is Devil's Eye, and so you can see this is my cave diving buddy here. This is, uh, and he has a tank on either side. So when we go cave diving, we have, like I said, we have a lot of special equipment. And this is an example of that special equipment where we would, instead of wearing a tank on our back, like you might normally see divers, we have one tank on either side of our body. And so the next slide is going to give you an example of what it looks like when I'm actually shooting these pictures underwater. And so this is me in Devil's Eye. And I'm not sure if it's going to play. Hopefully it will play. But you can see I have the camera set up on this tripod like I just showed you. And you can see that metal piece there um, that is holding the camera up. And I'm just taking the camera and I'm going to spin it around on keeping it in the same plot place the, and take pictures around in a complete circle there. And you can kind of see and the video might not be coming through very smoothly, but hopefully you can see now the front of the camera and I'm just going around and taking all these Yeah, sorry guys, it looks like we lost Jenny again for a moment. Hopefully she pops back in. Okay, so you can you can see Jenny just went out, so she's obviously going to try and restart her computer. Uh, while we wait for her, let's get a show of hands if anybody in those classrooms has ever been scuba diving before. Hands up if you've ever been scuba diving. A few hands. Hands up if you want to be a scuba diver. That's what I. That's what I like to see. Lots of hands for that. Excellent. 
All right. How many before talking to Jenny today had ever heard of an aquifer before? Hands up, nice and high. Oh, good. Lots of classrooms. Good. So you did your research. That's what I oh, like. Oh, sorry see. about that, guys. That's okay, Jenny. You're back. Yeah, my computer. Can you see me? Uh, not yet. We can hear you again. But okay. A moment to kick. Oh, there we go. We got you again. Okay. Awesome. Sorry about that, guys. It's okay. Technology mm -hmm. some days doesn't always yeah. cooperate fully. <laughs> yeah. So I will um, share my screen with you again so that you can see. Um, so you can see the. I don't know where I lost you last time. Um, you were just showing us the 360 camera, the so underwater. Can you, um, let's see. Can you. Um, Hmm. Let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. Desktop. Let's see if this works. Okay. Can you see my presentation now? Uh, yep. You just have okay. to go full screen. Okay. Awesome. There so, we go. Yay. This is what it looks like when we take all these pictures and put them back into the computer. So you can see here, each picture has a number on it. And these are all individual photos that I took that then you put into this program and then you can put them all together into uh, one picture. And so once they're all stitched together, this is what the final product looked like. So this is a full 360 view, fit view at the bottom of Devil's Eye, which is the one where you saw me taking that video. And so if we go here, now this is what it looks like once it's in the actual virtual tour and you can take your mouse and move it around the panorama to see um, what it looks like. But I don't think videos are working, so we're just gonna um, not, we're gonna not look at that now, but I'll give you guys a link to the virtual tour at the end. So this is what it looks like once you're inside the caves. And so as you can see, I have uh, my dive buddy here helping me by putting lights out because everything in the cave is completely pitch dark before we go in there. So like I said before, we have big lights and in some places we need up to 12 of them. And the reason for this is if you look at this big black um, kind of black opening on the left of the screen, that looks just like another little cave passageway, but that's actually big enough to drive a bus through. So what we had to do was go through in there and light up that whole next room so that you could see where you're going to swim through next and give you kind of some idea of how big the cave actually is. So here's another short video that shows me shooting these images in the caves. And as you can see, I have the camera kind of balanced on this limestone. And now I'm taking a picture up towards the ceiling. And you can see that I have uh, this limestone above my head. And then all the limestone around me here inside the actual cave. And then we're going to go into this bigger section of the cave when we're lighting up this massive spot. And my friend Leah here is going to help me move the lights around. And we can't talk underwater, so we have to give each other a lot of signals. And um, I'm holding a light here in my hand to kind of see what I'm doing and light up the foreground because one of the biggest challenges is kind of lighting up the entire picture to make it look even. And then the last spot that we shot was really challenging because see how it looks like it's snowing here? That's a lot of sand and silt that gets stirred up into the water that we have to be really careful about so that it doesn't ruin our pictures. But in the end, when we stitch together all these photos, this is an example of what the 360 images look like when you stitch them together for the cave. And so if you look very closely in the middle, you can see um, a diver swimming through the middle of them. And now I want to give you a little bit of a quick look at what the virtual tour looks like. So I'll, like I said, I'll give you guys a link at the end, but what you can do is enter the aquifer and swim around. And so this is what it looks like. The first screen that pops up and you have your controls at the bottom and then you can cl 
click through and um, there are different, so if you click on a camera icon, this will pop up and then you have this gray map in the right that shows you uh, where you are in the tour at all times. And then this photo here is showing you actually when I explained the tannic water before, this is what it looks like when you dive down beneath this um, dark tannic water that um, is coming in mixing with the spring water. And then this is an example of what it looks like where you enter the cave. So this tiny little, little hole there in the middle is where you enter that entire giant cave. And then on the right, we have next little camera icon there that's called the Grim Reaper sign. And we, this is outside of all big caves or all underwater caves in Florida that tells people to stop, prevent your death, go no further um, because it's dangerous and you could die there. But with the virtual tour, you can swim right on by. And so, like I said, we enter these caves, um, or we enter the caves through springs. And so, um, scientists like to use these springs as laboratories to study many different things. So here you can see a thing set up at Blue Spring, which has all these little sensors on it. And then this box here has the batteries to power all those sensors that are collecting measurements underwater. And then hydrologists, for example, in one of the labs uh, at the University of Florida are studying how this water moves. And so they can understand how it moves, where it goes, and how quickly it gets there, basically by putting this dye in the water. And this type of dye is called rhodamine, and it stains the water. It's non-toxic, um, but it stains the water, and then it allows them to trace it as it moves down the river. And this is called a dye trace study. And so it looks kind of red in the last picture, but as it starts to kind of spread out, it looks a little bit more orange and it moves throughout the spring. And we were swimming around as they released the dye and this bowfin, um, this fish is called the bowfin here in the front, came out and um, you can kind of see what was going on. Another thing that I looked at a couple years ago was these turtles that came into the spring. And so there were 500 turtles that came into one freshwater spring. And what they did was pretty interesting um, is that they came in and you can see some of them down here on the bottom that are, they're actually eating. And so they're little, like little lawnmowers. They came in and they ate all of the invasive hydrilla that was in the spring. And so I have some before and after pictures that show what it looks like before um, and after the turtles came in and ate the vegetation and they should pop up in a second. Um, but what they did was they selectively ate the invasive plant over the native plant, which was, which was pretty cool. And we were able to document that. So let me see if I can get the picture to pop up. So, okay, here we go. Here is what it looks like before and after they ate this vegetation. So at the top, you can see there's tons of it that's almost growing right up to the water surface. And then below it, it's just, they completely ate it all to the point where there's a sandy path in the middle. So I wanna share with you guys some of the amazing creatures that call the springs home. So this is a Florida manatee that was very curious and came and put its nose right up onto that glass dome port of the camera that I was showing you. And these manatees actually come into the springs during the winter months because they don't have a blubber layer like a whale does to keep them warm. Even though they're really big, they just, they need to be in warm water. And so the springs stay the same temperature year round. And they're a constant 72 degrees. So when the ocean gets really cold, the manatees will swim up into the springs to, um, to stay in the warm water and eat. And what they can eat actually up to 10% of their body weight every day. So about 1,000 pound manatee can eat about 100 pounds of plants in one day. There we go. So this was a baby manatee and a mo its mother that I saw come into a spring in Florida. And what was really cool is that they communicate using these kind of little squeaky noises. And so anytime the baby who was just learning to swim would get too far away from its mom, she they would make squeaky noises to communicate with each other. Another really common species in the springs is a sunfish. And this is a spotted sunfish. And basically, they're, they're pretty common around the springs and they'll come up to you. And I think this one again could see his reflection in the dome port of my camera. So he came up to have a closer look. And then this is a species of stingray that is the same species that lives in 
the ocean. And so if you've ever gone to the beach in Florida and kind of scuffed your feet along in the sand and a stingray moves, this is an Atlantic stingray, the same type, except this specific population has adapted to living in rivers um, in, and springs in Florida. So it's the only population, uh, no, known population of ray to have its entire life cycle in fresh water, which is pretty neat. And then this is an anhinga that is, or, sorry, not anhinga, a cormorant that is diving down into the Rainbow River. And the way you can tell the difference between a cormorant and an anhinga is a cormorant here has a hook at the end of its beak, if you look really closely, and an anhinga has a straight beak. And those are just because of the different ways that they fish and eat in the rivers. But like these plants and animals in the springs, we also rely on water from the aquifer, and it's kind of a delicate balance between humans and the animals and plants that call these springs home. And because the springs are made up of water flowing directly from the aquifer, we can use them as indicators of our drinking water. And so unfortunately, we are pumping out a lot of water of the aquifer and also polluting it. And so what we see is these resulting changes in the springs. And so many springs that used to have this beautiful flowing grass like this, now are filled with a lot of algae like this. And so algae in little bits is healthy for the ecosystem, but when it starts to become this nuisance kind of um, overburdening algae that takes over the ecosystem, it can be, it's really bad. And so this picture here, for example, might look kind of pretty with the sun rays, but if you look at the bottom of the spring, you don't see any of that nice flowing vegetation. It's all this dark algae and the water isn't clear like some of those first photos that I showed you. Instead, it's kind of has all of this um, this stuff particulates floating in it and so here is a spring that's that's really not doing well this is um, this is full of all this algae and these invasive tilapia fish and so basically what we're doing is we're pumping out too much water and things that we do at the surface affect the springs too like if we um, dump pesticides or herbicides or if there's manure and runoff from farms and um, agriculture and also just our daily actions if we put fertilizer on our lawn it can make its way down into the spring mostly because we live just right on top of the aquifer so what we really need to do is use less and pollute less and we can get more people to realize um, where our water comes from and get involved in protecting the water so we can make sure there's enough water left for us and the springs and make sure that for future generations there's clean and abundant water. So you guys are really our future leaders and will soon be the ones that'll be tasked with managing this water. And so I really encourage you to learn more about your water, whether it's looking through a microscope to see the invertebrates that live in the water or going for a paddle out on the river to learn. These students in Central Florida went for a paddle on the Wikiwachi River, which comes out of um, a gi the giant first magnitude Wikiwachi spring. And they learn more about the plants and the ecosystems around there. And I also encourage you to just jump in. If you have water near you, jump in the water, learn more about it, learn where it comes from and how humans are affecting this water. And uh, you can also join local river cleanups and work with local conservation organizations and really get involved with citizen science and collecting water samples in your area. And what I'm doing with kids here in Florida is taking them out to the springs to take underwater pictures. And so I just would encourage you like this to jump in the water and, um, you know, get your hands. If you do have a camera, you can take pictures, but you don't even need to just to be there to experience it and learn about what's in it is really all it takes. And so last thing, I will just leave you with the uh, link to the virtual tour so that you can jump in and get exploring in the Florida aquifer if you would like to. And I'm sorry about some of the technical difficulties, but I would love to take your questions now if you guys have them. All right, Jenny, thanks so much. And don't worry about the tech. It can slow us down sometimes, but it definitely couldn't beat us today. We pulled it off. So thank awesome. you so much for taking us to a place where, you know, many may not have known existed and even fewer are going to get to visit. So I think what you've put together, this tour is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So just a reminder before we meet some of our classrooms, and we have a great group today, um, you can get involved on Twitter. We have lots of classrooms watching live today, so please use the hashtag Let's Explore, so no apostrophe, and get your questions in. In fact, let's start off with one from Twitter from the AJW Library. They're wondering, how much does all of the equipment you use for pictures weigh? How much does it weigh? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, the camera itself isn't super heavy, actually, in underwater, once you get it um, in the water, it's actually pretty neutrally buoyant, so it kind of just stays wherever you put it. 
um, which is really nice. But what, what does weigh a lot is all of the lights that you have to bring down and move around. So with up to 12 lights, you will need at least two other people in the water with you to carry all of them. And then you also have your big tanks that are pretty heavy. So I'm not sure about the actual weight of everything combined, but I would say that it probably almost outweighs <laughs> maybe almost outweighs me if you were to put a lot of it together um, but once you get in the water the amazing thing is that it's all you can add air to your um, to your the vest that you're wearing and then you become neutrally buoyant so you don't have any weight at all all right well let's meet a classroom so first classroom is mrs. Bryson uh, Evans classroom they're joining us from Fort Mill South Carolina grade 6 class your microphone is on go ahead yes I am one of my students Micah has a question when did you decide you wanted to start diving in underwater caves and caverns and be a freshwater conservationist? Thanks, Monica. That's a great question. So I actually studied marine biology when I was in college. And so I was obsessed with fish and um, turtles and kind of studying the ocean and coral reefs. But when I moved to Florida in 2011, after I graduated from college, I started, I discovered the springs in the aquifer and kind of fell in love with them and started to understand how fresh water and salt water and all the water on our planet is really connected. So even though I had studied marine biology, I realized, wow, this fresh water is really important and we rely on it to drink. And so I started taking pictures of it and um, really through photography was the reason why I got interested in these springs and wanted to kind of document them to share with other people because I realized people couldn't see them. So. At some point, maybe I'll start going back into the ocean to do more projects there. But I think that once I realized that the, the ecosystems were kind of in trouble and needed to be shared with the freshwater part of it, um, that's really how I got started on that. So, Great question. Why don't you jump in with one more quick one? Yes. Um, Jackson, can you ask your question, please? Yes, ma'am. I would like to know, I have an understanding that the High Plains Aquifer in the Midwest is running out of water. How can these farmers help to replenish this without growing less crops? So, I mean, that's a great question, Jackson. I think that um, something that they're really struggling with right now out there and something that people probably spend a lot of time working on. And, um, I'm not sure specifically for those um, those farmers because I know that there's a lot of technology that they use to try to use less water and maybe grow a different type of crops or um, use a different yeah a different um, version variety of the seed. But I do know that um, right now the way that they're using it is not necessarily sustainable and they need to come up with new ways to do that. But in Florida, I know that there's um, some people at university. Of Florida who are studying specific ways to use less water on the crops here and they are coming up with some really innovative and interesting uh, ways to use less water and I think that there's huge promise for that and getting out to farms because it's not necessarily we need to butt heads with the farmers because I think a lot of times they feel blamed that people are blaming them for what's happening but I think if we can all work together on the solutions and uh, work with these farmers to maybe use less water and not necessarily um, you know, make them go away or feel like they're being blamed. Um, that's a big part of the equation. So um, I'm not sure of the exact things that they're doing to use less water, but I think that um, they're definitely working on uh, a lot of them right now that show a lot of promise. All right, solid questions from South Carolina. Let's meet our next class. They're a grade five class joining us from uh, Kamana Bay in the Cayman Islands. I'll turn your microphone on and go ahead with a couple questions for Jennifer. Who wants to ask a second question? Uh, yeah. Hey, wait, come on. Over here. Hello. Hi. How long have you been diving for? I've been diving since 2008, I think. Yeah, 2008. So, so for a while now. I don't know. How old are you guys? Uh, okay, so I've been diving for maybe almost as long as you've been alive, a couple years less. <laughs> Do you want to be a diver? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. Um, how deep do you usually go when you dive? So when we're shooting that virtual tour in Jenny Springs, the, uh, the maximum depth in that system tends to be around 100 feet. 
Um, but when we were shooting the tour, uh, a lot of the places we were going were about only about 60 feet deep. So in a lot of them, places in the aquifer, it will stay around 100. But there are some big cave systems that I've never gone into, but some people will go down like over 200 or 300 feet deep, which is pretty deep. All right, great questions. Thanks a lot, guys. Let's meet our next class. Mrs. Fine's class is joining us from uh, Park Hill in Ontario. They're a grade seven, eight class, and your microphone should be on. Go ahead with some questions. All right. Billy, go ahead. Um, do any of the springs connect up to other bodies of water, like oceans and stuff? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Um, so there are actually springs that are out that, that um, go up into the ocean, and so in, even in places like Florida. So um, people will study those as well. Um, there, some of them are harder to get to or harder to find, but they're called them submarine springs. And then there are also springs that come up. So some springs will just come up by themselves, and then they flow and connect into a river. And then other springs will come up. Um, there can be spring-fed lakes and ponds. Um, in Florida as well. So yeah, they have huge connect connectivity to a lot of other bodies of water. So that's why, partially why, I mean, they're really important because if we can help protect the quality of water in the aquifer, we can also help protect these ponds and lakes um, that, are, that are also connected to it. And the species that rely on the freshwater for the ones that flow up in the ocean too. Oh, that's great. Does anyone else in there have a question? Um, what are your qualifications? <laughs> what was that? qualifications oh for dive for diving you mean or for your job for my job oh. <laughs> um well i guess there's uh, there's kind of a lot of things that go into it so i have an undergraduate degree in marine biology and i just am now in the fourth year of my phd so i'm in grad school uh studying basically the springs and the aquifer and then in terms of, so i've been in school for almost 20 years of my life now. <laughs> but uh, then in terms of diving, what you have to do is you get your open water certification uh, and then you get your um, advanced and your nitrox and then you uh, can move on after you've done a certain number of dives and you do your rescue diver and then you can get your cave certification, which usually takes about a week of diving um, almost all day um, underwater to try to get enough hours and experience um, in, these, in the caves. Okay, so before we meet our next class, we're going to grab one from Twitter. Uh, Mrs. Mangeli is wondering if the aquifer tours are available on Google Expeditions. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Oh, is that the one that's connected to Google Earth? Where you can use the, the Google Cardboard and the look around 360 with oh, it? Oh, yeah. So actually, the, it, it should be available on there if you... Um, if you put it into one of the viewers, but I haven't, because what my main goal when I created that was to bring it around to classrooms when I go visit them. So then we take kids on a uh, field trip to the Springs and then show them the virtual tour on a computer. But I, what I really want to do when I go into the classrooms is be able to have these goggles um, so that they can put them on and kind of experience that. But I haven't, um, and I've, I've tried it once, but I, there might be some more bugs to work out there with the goggles, but that's like, that would be the, the ultimate goal. Um, even after the kids explored on the computer, because having that immersive experience, I think, would be really neat. All right. Uh, Mrs. Schnexer's group is joining us from Virginia Beach, Virginia, K to five group. Um, your microphone should be on. All right, Zoe, do you have a question? What's your favorite part about studying the aquifer? Thank you, Zoe. Um, I think my favorite part is being able to go. Um, underwater and kind of be in these places that are completely dark and um, just are right beneath our feet and um, experience something like it's completely quiet the only sounds that you can hear are basically sounds like thunder when you're when you exhale your bubbles make this noise it almost shakes all the water around you as it goes back up through the ceiling so it's kind of this just a really cool way um, to escape and be be underground all right, awesome. And then we have one more. Devin, do you want to ask your question? How much water can an aquifer hold? Oh, that's a great question. The aquifer, I mean, I've heard estimates of the Florida aquifer holding about a quadrillion gallons of water, which is kind of this 
I don't know, a crazy amount of water. But the thing is, um, the reason why we sometimes worry about having enough water is that the only the, the very top of the aquifer or, you know, a certain part of it is fresh water. So if you go down really deep in the water, it's more saline. So it's saltier water and it would be more expensive to treat that water if we wanted to drink it. So there is a lot of water there, but um, if we pollute the top of it, if we pollute it and we um, take too much of it, it will be more salty and it'll be harder to drink. It's a great question. All right, let's jump to our next classroom. We have Mrs. Plants Group joining us from Brampton, Ontario. They're a grade eight class and your microphone should be on. Yeah. Hey guys. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay. How are your caves made? How are keys made? Oh, that's a great question. So in Florida, actually, the caves, the limestone and the sediment that makes up the actual caves now was originally the bottom of a shallow ocean. So millions of years ago, this, um, you know, Florida was underneath a really shallow sea. And it was basically depositing all of this um, the calcium carbonate onto the bottom and so it's a lot of the limestone when you look closely at it is made up of shells and old coral fossils and some um, also you know we'll find sea dot say um sorry sea biscuits or sand dollar fossils in there as well and so it's really it's made up of rock that used to be um, the floor of an ocean and what happens is once the sea level went down, so after about 23 million years ago when it was a sea, um, this, the ocean, the sea level started dropping and then um, it started to, um, the, you know, it was exposed at the surface, the limestone was, and then when it rains now, the water can get through, like I said, the water combines with carbon dioxide and makes this carbonic acid and it can dissolve the rock little by little and as it dissolves it, um, you know, it makes these cavities and holes into the ground and then it can let water get in and the water can continue to carve, um, carve out these holes and carve out these places where, where we can swim through. So it's kind of an ongoing process where when the water flows through, the caves are constantly moving and shifting and, um, you know, are constantly, uh, the water is, is continually making new passageways, which is cool. Go ahead if you have another one, Brampton. Hi, how do you find your way back up? Oh, good question. Hey, I'll, I'll show you something. Um, so we have what we call uh, spools and reels. So when we go into the cave, we, we bring these with us. And what it is, it just looks like a fishing line kind of. And we take this, and one of the main rules of cave diving is to have a continuous guideline to the surface, which just means always have a rope that goes up to the top, basically. So that if you're in there and you don't know how to get out, you just um, you let this out as you go. And then um, it lets you find your way back. So you have to actually, while you're swimming, you have to let this reel out. You tie it to something and then let it reel out the whole time. And then when you come back, you have to you reel it all the way out. All right, another solid group of questions. Thanks, Brampton. Yeah, thanks, Not too far from me, probably about 40, 45 minutes down the road. Um, actually, another class pretty close by, Mr. Caverhills in Toronto, Ontario. Grade fours are joining us. Uh, I'll just need you to turn the mic on for me and fire away with a couple questions. Um, what's the strangest animal you ever saw in the office? In the aquifer. Oh, that's a that's a really good question. So the aquifer, one of the reasons why I wanted to make the virtual tour is because like the coolest thing about swimming in the aquifer a lot of times is you know these passageways and these rocks. But the things that tend to live in the aquifer have to, are have to be specially adapted to living in the caves. So there are these tiny, um, a lot of times white or albino cave crayfish that live in there. And so they'll be, you know, only this, only a couple inches long and completely white. So it looks like a white mini lobster and they feed on um, organic matter and detritus and stuff that falls down to the spring from above. And they're really specific to the places they live in. So they're pretty neat creatures. Hi. 
Hi, um, when we grow up, what kind of jobs could we have to protect the water? Oh, great, awesome question. So there, you could uh, have a lot of different jobs and you can do it even if you don't, if your job isn't to protect the water, but um, you can work for an environmental protection department or you, know, you could be a biologist and study the types of animals that live there or you could work in water conservation and kind of help people use less water. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that you can help. And I mean, you can even start now by going out and learning more about your water or learning how you can use less water or um, yeah, having a job and leading a lifestyle that like, you know, you use less water to take showers or brush your teeth and stuff like that. All Good right, job. another great group of questions. So we're gonna meet our last <laughs> class, but before we do, I'm just gonna give a shout out to uh, a homeschool who's watching along from uh, Braveheart, Florida. They just sent us a cool picture. So uh, oh, great. Keep sending your messages with the Let's Explore hashtag, and we're glad you guys are joining us. Um, our last class joining us today is Mrs. Burgeon's grade twos from Arlington, Virginia. Thanks for being so patient. Uh, turn your mic on for me and go ahead with some questions. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jackie, and my question is, what is something that surprises you about fresh water? Oh, great question, Jackie. I think what surprises me every time I go into a spring is how clear the water is. And so, I mean, that might change if we keep, if we do pollute it a lot more, but when you go in and you feel like you can fly because the water is, is so clear, it kind of every time I go in, it, it um, makes me really excited. Thank you, Jackie. Hi. Hello, I'm Madison. And my Madison. question is, how do you manage to do all of your work with that heavy gear on? Oh, that's a good question, Madison. So when I put on all the gear, what I do is I have this other special, so all the gear is really heavy, but then I have this special thing that I put on called the BC. And this lets me, what I do is I have air on my sides and then I can fill it up with air, which fills up this big thing on the back. And that makes it so that um, all of my other, it kind of, it makes me stay buoyant and neutrally buoyant in the water so that I don't weigh anything underwater with this on. So it's not heavy at all. So all I have to do is carry it down to the water and that's the hard part. And then once you get in the water, it's nice and, um, you're nice and weightless. Thank you. Madison. Anyone else all right. Awesome. Let's, um, grab one more from online. We have a group from grade sevens from Winnipeg, uh, in Manitoba, so in Canada, who are aspiring explorers and scientists, and they're wondering what questions has your work inspired in you? Oh, that's a great question. Well, let's see. I think it has really inspired um, me to help other people see the aquifer, and so it's kind of inspired me to ask why people don't know where their water comes from or how the best ways are to communicate to people about water, because I think that people are really busy and they have a lot of things going on in their lives and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world. And if you're going to inconvenience them by making them have to learn about the water, then that's no fun. So I think it's inspired me to come up with new ways to show people what their water looks like and new ways to get people involved and engaged in um, their fresh water and help them understand why it's actually interesting to learn about and how they can personally make a difference by, um, you know, changing how they live with water and how they view and respect water. And so I think one of the main ways that happened for me since I'm a biologist uh, by training is by helping people understand that not only do we rely on the water, but um, that, you know, there's ecosystems and organisms that also rely on it that we can help protect um, save by also using less water ourselves. So if there is enough water for everyone to use, just not enough for everyone to waste. And um, we kind of can all work together to make there be enough for everyone. All right. And we'll wrap with one more question from online. We've got a class from Greenville, South Carolina joining us. And they're wondering about some of the major pollutants getting into the aquifers. Can you give some examples? Oh, yeah, for sure. So some of the main pollutants that, you know, people do in their everyday lives are, you know, if you fertilize your lawn, that can make its way back down into the aquifer. Another big one is stormwater runoff. So when it rains, all of the water from the streets and everything, which has like motor oil and gasoline and any other or chemicals in it, um, gets run, runs off through the drains and then goes directly into the creeks. It doesn't get treated or anything before it gets out into the um, to the natural ecosystem. Uh, and then another big one is, you know, if you put farms or um, agriculture 
or you know if you have cattle or something in an area where the aquifer is particularly vulnerable a lot of their um, waste it can go right into the aquifer as well so there's some of the main ones all right well Jenny thank you so much for doing this for us today it was an absolute blast and I know the classrooms learned a ton and we're just getting one question popping up which would be kind of a cool one to wrap on is any career advice for aspiring scientists out there? Yeah, so I think that, um, I'm st I mean, I'm still in school and I think that people always ask what you wanna do and you don't need to know in college, you don't need to know in high school and you don't need to stress about what your particular path is gonna be towards what your dream job is because there's so many different pathways to get there. So you don't have to you know, follow exactly in someone else's footsteps. You can make your own path and um, really you know, do whatever your dream job, job is while working really hard at something that you love and instead of you know, trying to figure out what someone else did and do exactly that same thing. So I think that would be my best career advice. All right, excellent advice. I agree with that 100%. So before we do sign off and say goodbye, uh, I'd let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. I'm gonna let uh, the amazing Megan jump back in and she's gonna talk a little more from the Nat Geo education side. Thanks, Joe. Uh, from all of us at National Geographic, I just wanna say thank you so much to our fabulous explorer, Jennifer Adler. This has been wonderful and we really appreciate you sharing your photos, stories, gear, and inspiration with us. And thanks also to our trusty host, Joe Grabowski. Finally, thank you to our classrooms watching who shared some really great and really interesting questions. I really appreciated those. And just as a reminder, please check out our website, natgeoeded.org slash Explorer Classroom for updates on the next Explorer Classroom. More details will be posted there very, very soon. Thank all you right. so much, Megan and Joe. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. You guys all had awesome questions. All right. Well, thank you to the classroom stretching from the Caymans all the way up to here in Canada. Uh, thank you to those online. We had a great group sending in questions online today. So that was amazing. And uh, I'm going to turn the microphones on, let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. So it might get a little loud. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Say goodbye and thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Have a great week, and we'll see you on the next Explore Classroom. I'll say bye.